top three things in my notebook. Number one is the US dollar. It's all the same big macro trade, but number one is the US dollar. Number two is the 10-year bond yield. And number three is the S&P 500 and how it's correlating to both. Uh, the first point would be on the US dollar. So the US dollar now looks to me that it is narrowing its risk range. Now, a narrowing risk range means less volatility. And what's really driven uh, what we call the correlation risk trade in all of macro for the last couple of weeks is in fact dollar volatility. So we had dollar down, energy up. Then on the jobs report, we had a big spike up in the dollar and a lot of things that were correlated to that uh, on the way down. So again, I think that we're past kind of the, uh, at least the higher volatility point of that. And again, that's just measured by measuring the risk range, which is a price volume volatility signal that I built myself. And again, that's what I'd have to say about that. So again, if the dollar stops going down, I think that energy is most likely, and oil specifically, is done going up. So that would be how you play that correlation risk point from a risk management perspective. The second one is the 10-year bond yield. Now this absolutely has nothing to do with the oil trade. This has everything to do with the jobs report now pulling forward for the umpteenth time expectation as interest rates are going higher. Now they are a lot higher than where they were a week ago. I think we're ticking right around 2% on the 10 year bond yield right now. But again, the risk range is like 161 to 201 right now. And again, that's a very wide range with a lot of downside. So again, I went through it in the early look note this morning. Really next week you get CPI and PPI reports in the US, which will be deflationary. So that's gonna bring back uh, the talk about the other side of what the Fed has to deal with. They don't, they don't just talk about employment growth, they talk about inflation. And again, a CPI reading of below 1% is what we have in our model. And we don't think that the Fed has it in them to get more hawkish in the face of that. So that's next week. And again, I think that that would dominate next week. So think about that as you move forward. And again, the employment report, don't forget that the February employment report could be as bad as the January one was good. So you can go into the Fed meeting, which is on March the 18th, in the early part of March when you get the February employment report, and you could have a bad employment report with falling inflation expectations, which should remind you quite you know, succinctly uh, of the environment that we had at the beginning of January. So again, people were concerned about growth slowing, and they were concerned about deflation. That's why bond yields hit really uh, three-year lows. What was it? Again, they hit three-year lows for good reason. Now, the final point is the S&P 500. Again, it's not broken, so I don't know why you wouldn't buy it on pullbacks. Uh, the S&P 500 looks, uh, looks less good, I guess, than the Russell 2000. I put up a sh short video on that yesterday on the Y, so you can review that if you want. Uh, but again, the S&P 500, it held its immediate term trade line of 2038 support and has no resistance to 2066. And then the next resistance above that is 2075. So again, it's a nothing market, right? The S&P 500 is down 0.6% for the year to date. So you get paid to risk manage the market. If you want to buy and hold a market that doesn't go up at all on an absolute basis, you can do that, but you're not going to make any money. If you want to buy high, you're going to lose money. If you want to buy low, you might actually make something. And those are your top three things.